Good morning, everyone. So we're back in business. Uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge the Intra City Geeks again. Thank you, Arnell, for coming. And uh, I'll introduce myself to all of you guys later. But thank you. You're welcome uh, here. And I think you're going to enjoy uh, what you see this morning. And I'm glad that we still had some leftover breakfast for you. So that's wonderful. It's a great pleasure to welcome Scott Friend back to Brown. Scott is a Brown alum of uh, OT4. No. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <That'd be nice. laughs> uh, and he's an incredible supporter of entrepreneurship in general. He was just telling the story about some involvement uh, in the Boston community. Uh, but he's come back to Brown many, many times. I met him first through Danny Warshe, who was a classmate and friend of Scott's. And uh, Scott's sort of a famous uh, uh, cameo appearance in Engine 1010, Danny's class, and all the rest of us who teach Engine 1010 wish he came into our class. Anytime. Uh, but uh, uh, he's he's the subject of uh, of one of the I don't know I don't know if, he, if any HBS case is famous, but there is at least at Brown University the Profit Logic case is famous, and so he figures prominently as the protagonist of that interesting story. But at any rate, uh, we asked him to come to B Lab at the uh, in the penultimate week, uh, because uh, we're gearing up to, to uh, pitch our ventures in B Lab. And so we wanted to hear from somebody whose business is to listen to pitches. Uh, that's what he does all day, every day, not probably every day, but frequently. And so he's here to help you guys figure out how to talk about your ventures. And so I'll let uh, Scott do the rest of the introduction, but again, so grateful that you've made time to be with us. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. Good morning, everybody. Um, how many folks in the room are Brown students? Raise your hands. So I can see it's like half. Great. Awesome. Um, a little bit of the background and a little bit of my path to where I am today hinges on my experience at Brown. Actually, a lot of it hinges on my experience at Brown, so I'll share that as well. And just to clarify a bit, um, I, I've spent the last 10 years, almost 11 now, listening to pitches from entrepreneurs, typically very early stage entrepreneurs, almost every day. The prior 10 years, I spent building a company. And so I've sat in your shoes raising money for a good portion of my career, and I've now been on the other side of the table for, for the sort of the second chapter of my career. So hopefully can share some perspective from both sides and happy to answer any questions along the way. I don't have much material prepared. I'm going to share a few stories and a little bit about my background. And please feel free to interrupt me and ask anything you want along the way. And if I don't know the answer or I want to skip it, I won't be shy about telling you. So there's a really big picture of me. I don't think I've ever actually seen it that large <laughs> up close. Um, not sure that's necessary when I'm standing right here. Um, let me give you a little bit of background. So um, prior to joining, I'm at Bank Capital. Do you guys know Bank Capital? Yes. Big private equity firm in Boston. <laughs> Within the umbrella of all the kind of different asset classes at Bank Capital, one big piece of that is venture. And so we have a dedicated fund that does nothing but venture capital. And we've been raising venture capital funds and investing them for 15 years. Um, and that's what I do. Uh, so it's not, not to be confused in a sense with the part of Bank Capital that buys big public companies and takes them private, um, which we also do. And there's a lot of synergy between what we do in the venture group and what they do in the private equity business. Um, but they're buying companies like Toys R Us and we're investing in technology companies that sell software to people like Toys R Us. Um, I, uh, in 98, uh, started a company called, that became Profit Logic, and so has anyone in the class taken the Engineering 1010 class and done the case? So got it. So you've seen it. I think I wasn't here this year for it, but I think it was probably here every year for the prior 10 or so. Um, Profit Logic was uh, a software company that helped retailers figure out when to take markdowns. So if you walk into uh, Ann Taylor or J. Crew or Macy's, if those still exist. Um, and you see a sign that says 50% off, our software is in there calculating which items to mark down in which stores. And that's become a bit of a standard in the industry at this point. In the days when we were doing it, <coughs> starting in the late 90s into the early 2000s, um, the, the, the concept of big data and analytics, which are common terms today, didn't exist. Data science wasn't really a thing. But taking data that came from point of sale in retail and sitting in databases and using some smart PhDs to crunch numbers and give some insight was a very valuable thing to do. And in fact, building a team of kind of uh, math and science 
PhDs in Cambridge to help retailers who were typically gut feel oriented decision makers was a little bit like shooting fish in a barrel. Like a any of you in this room with a spreadsheet in those days could have outperformed the decisions the retailers were making on their own. We were applying a bunch of computing power and a bunch of analysis to make that even better. Um, but it, it was a good business. And, and we built that up over seven years, uh, did not have really any competition in part because of the, the intellectual property on which the business was built and ultimately sold the company to Oracle uh, where I spent a year thereafter. A um, little bit of a Brown connection on the story. So actually a big Brown connection. So my, um, anybody live in West Quad freshman year? Who was at Brown? How's that possible? It's not called West Quad anymore? Keeney, Keeney Quad. Keeney Quad. Yeah. Still only one person and two people. Um, so one, my, one of my best friends to this day who was on my freshman hall at Brown, um, his father, who I met because this kid was my best friend, um, I stumbled into a, at a wedding, a mutual friend's wedding, probably five, six years after, maybe seven, eight years after college. And he had a little boutique consulting shop where he was doing analysis for retailers and brands and building forecasting models to help them forecast demand. And it was just him and one other guy. And they thought they had kind of stumbled into something really valuable, which was the ability to forecast demand for fashion items not just kind of traditional basic items where the forecasting techniques are pretty straightforward, like time series techniques work well, but for fashion items where there isn't an obvious repeat of behavior season after season and where the demand curve is sort of nonlinear and hard to model. And he thought he had stumbled into it. He didn't know what to do with it. Long story short, I joined him to build ProfitLogic. So this was the father of my best friend from Brown. Almost didn't do it because he had a small profitable consulting shop and I knew that if we were successful, I was going to turn it into a totally unprofitable software company very quickly. Um, and that might ruin whatever he had uh, going already. But fortunately, it all worked out. So we started that company, as I said, in 98, sold it to Oracle in 2005. I spent a year at Oracle in their retail industry group and then joined Bain Capital. And Bain was my biggest investor. So that's how I kind of ended up where I am today. Um, so that's, I guess, kind of my path. And I went to business school uh, a couple years, probably six years after, um, after I left Brown. I was at IBM for the six years between Brown and, and business school. Any questions about that? Great. Um, a little bit about my investment kind of portfolio, just so you guys have a sense. I, almost everything I've done since I've become an investor has been stuff that touches the commerce world in some way, because it's kind of the area that I know best through my own career prior to getting to Bain. Um, so a bunch of what I've done are tools and technologies that help retailers, both online and offline, operate more effectively, like ProfitLogic was, tools that help them improve their business. And a handful of what I've done are actually direct-to-consumer things. So next generation retail and commerce and brand-oriented models that have some kind of interesting defensibility or IP. Um, sort of the, and the consumer things are the things you probably know better um, because they're consumer things. So you may know Jet, which was a big online retailer that sold to Walmart a year ago. We were the original investor in Jet. Um, uh, you may know, anybody know Rent the Runway? Mm -hmm. Rent the Runway is a business that I was the original investor in and still the largest investor in. Um, great company, really interesting business, continues to grow rapidly, still private maybe a public company in the next year or two. Um, so that's a little bit about past investments. And then this is my current portfolio, which again is a mix. Rent the Runway and Four Moms are consumer businesses. Persado, Media Radar, Semantic Machines, M Particle, and Flow are all B2B kind of enterprise companies helping marketers and retailers and brands operate more effectively. Cool? Everyone with me? So none of that is what I came here to talk about today. But that gives you a little bit of background. Yes? I uh, just, since you invited questions, I'll just ask one. Which is more fun, being an entrepreneur or an investor? Um, it's definitely more fun being an entrepreneur. And it's definitely less stressful being an investor. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's really interesting. Um, uh, I definitely miss, I miss the highs and lows of being an entrepreneur. Um, by definition, as an entrepreneur, and you guys are all doing it, like your eggs are all sort of in one basket. Um, but there's something about that purity of belief and focus that I really enjoyed. Um, and obviously, it's nice in retrospect when things work out. And, and fortunately, ProfitLogic worked out. Um, 
And I actually didn't think, I, I didn't really want to become an investor. That like, wasn't like high on my list of things to go do next. I wanted to start another company and um, sat around both the year I was at Oracle and then uh, you know, uh, some period of time afterwards, even the first year I was at Bain Capital, trying to think about what company I was going to start next. And when I started at Bain, I started as a venture partner, which is a little bit of a fancy title, meaning we're not sure he's actually going to become an investor. He may go start another company. And uh, I actually, it's a longer story, but I'm not sure I had, I, I definitely didn't have the idea that I wanted to do next, that I felt as passionate about as I did Profit Logic. And candidly, I didn't have the naivete uh, or the hunger that I probably needed to do it again. Because sitting back after the seven years of Profit Logic from start to finish, realizing how many things broke our way to get where we got no matter all the things you do well and great team and everything else, like things still have to break your way. It was hard for me to believe that lightning was going to strike again, unless it was something that I just could not do. And so, and I didn't stumble into that. And in parallel, I got more and more engaged as an investor. And ultimately, once you build a portfolio of companies that you really like, and you get, a get to work with a bunch of entrepreneurs that you really enjoy working with, this becomes a great job too. And so I love it but there's nothing like being an entrepreneur. And if you want to be an investor some, someday, the best way to become an investor is go build a company and make your investors a lot of money and then they'll want to hire you. <laughs> so, it's my path. So, context for this discussion. These are the three points I thought would be interesting, which is why do what you guys are all thinking about doing? Is that a good idea? Um, uh, my perspective as I'm talking to entrepreneurs, like everyone in the room, on what I look for when someone's pitching me. And then we'll obviously kind of talk this through as you guys are going through your pitches later this morning. Um, and that's the last, the last piece. So let me talk about why I start a company today. And I'll give an example from my own experience and how the world's evolved. In 1999, sort of the year after we started what became Profit Logic, one of our first customers was this company, Hills Department Stores, no longer in existence. And Hills Department Stores agreed to do a 10-week project with us and gave us $600,000 to do this project. We were building some replenishment forecasting algorithm for them. This is before we had sort of stumbled into markdown optimization as our killer app. And so we were just doing a bunch of opportunistic deals wherever we could, leveraging our capabilities. And they sent us a whole bunch of data in that era, it was like megabytes of data. So it doesn't sound like much today, but it seemed like a lot at the time. And it came on cartridge tapes, which no one in this room has ever seen, I promise you. Um, but these were tapes that you then loaded into a data storage device with a mainframe and crunched. And for this 10-week project, where we got $600,000, it took us nine weeks and cost us a million dollars to load the data. Now, I, you guys are all in business. Does that seem like a good business? <laughs> Didn't seem all that good to me, right? So 600K seemed like a great deal. Took us nine weeks before we even started our analysis to get Oracle up and running, load the data, and get it in a form that we can even do our work. And then a week of all-nighters to actually do the thing we told them we were going to do. And it cost us a million bucks. We lost $400,000 on that project. That was not so great. Roll the clock forward 10 years. My chief scientist at Profit Logic went on to start a company that we backed called Sequotient, which was in many ways doing a next gen version of Profit Logic, data and analytics for big retailers. But when you roll the clock forward to 2009, the, the amount of data that retailers were, were ingesting and subsequently giving to this vendor were orders of magnitude larger. These were petabytes of data because it was clickstream data from the web, uh, social data in addition to all the transaction data that we typically would get. Um, Rama's first customer was Macy's, who did a pilot project for $100,000 and sent him petabytes of data, which he loaded in AWS over a weekend and crunched the numbers and sent back his results and got a bill from AWS for $7.82. <laughs> Literally, he had it on the wall in their office because he had lived this with me and subsequently did this 10 years later. So talk about the difference in economics to start a company. Now this is a sort of data-centric example, 
but it's no different as you guys know if you're building any technology and you're leveraging free tools and you're leveraging cheap storage that you can get on demand and computing power that you can get on demand. So now we're almost 10 years past that, right? And it's only gotten better. So I, I don't think there's ever been a better time to be an entrepreneur because the amount of capital you need to get started and prove what you need to prove has never been lower. So I think you guys are all smart to be doing what you're doing. So, so let's jump to kind of what I look for when I'm uh, talking to entrepreneurs. So this is my top 10 list. Number one, team. You guys hear this all the time, I'm sure, the importance of team, and I think we should spend a fair amount of time talking about what that means. But that's always on the top of my list. Number two, team. Number three, team. Any guesses on number four? Team, one. Great, why? This point's really true. Um, I have backed really interesting companies with really interesting businesses um, that didn't work and we lost our money or didn't get much back. And I have backed questionable business opportunities with amazing teams that somehow just find a way to win. And they find a way to build partnerships and get customers and find someone to buy their company and they do well and we do well. And there's somehow some magic in those entrepreneurs that makes all the difference in the world. Mark Lorry, who's the founder of Jet.com, you guys know the Jet story, roughly? Built this business, which was intended to be essentially a competitor to Amazon, leveraging a bunch of technology to allow for a basket of goods that you buy online to be cheaper than the basket you would buy from Amazon because they were, they were kind of benefiting from shipping efficiencies by ensuring that anytime you put something in your basket, Merchants were bidding on your basket, and a merchant who had those goods in one DC versus on Amazon, you know, you might buy 10 items from 10 different places, and they come in 10 different boxes. These were all sort of being shipped together. Um, anyhow, it was a brilliant idea, but it was a brilliant idea with someone who knew he needed to raise over a billion dollars to make it successful. And this was a seed investment. And it was a seed investment at a 90 million pre valuation. He was raising $50 million at 90 pre. Seed. So like, who would do that? Well, this entrepreneur, he's one of the best I've ever met, Jen Hyman at Rent the Runway, I put in the same category, is one of these people who you, you, you read the proposition or you, someone tells you the story and you think, okay, that's just silly. Like, maybe that's gonna work, but I'm not betting on that. And by the time they're done pitching you, you're like, oh yeah, that's just math. Of course that's gonna work. And what, what is it that allows them to kind of convince you in the room? In my experience, it's a combination of being able to sell the dream at 20,000 feet, right? You've got to be passionate about your idea and that, pa that, 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 that passion has to be contagious. And so you've got to sell the dream. But selling the dream isn't enough. It's not good enough just to be a good salesperson. The best entrepreneurs I've met can also drill into the minute detail of every aspect of their business and truly understand the economics and how it works and answer every question. You could, you could sit with Jen Hyman today, who's the CEO of Rent the Runway. Now we launched in 09, so what is that? You know, eight years, since, literally eight years this month since the start of the company. It's now a you know, $130, $140 million business this year, a couple million items in that distribution center, millions of customers. And she can tell you more fluently than anyone else in the company exactly how the back end operations of that business work. And that's not the main part of the business that she focuses on. And that back end operation, as I said, is multiple millions of items, the largest dry cleaning operation in the world, 360 degree logistics, right? Because everything we send out comes back again four days later. Anyhow, it's complex and no one understands it better than she does and no one can explain it better than she does. That's what makes a great entrepreneur. So I'm, I'm big on team, in case you didn't notice. But there is some other stuff that also matters because a great team without a compelling idea probably doesn't get the job done. So, so what makes a compelling idea? Here's the stuff that I try to kind of focus on early on. And granted, at an early stage, none of this is known, right? Like you can't necessarily prove empirically the answers to any of the things I'm gonna ask, um, but they still matter and you need a point of view. So kind of this idea of disruption, which I think is a term that's sort of thrown around indiscriminately today, I think the, 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 the essence of what it means is important. And to me what it means is, is this evolution or revolution? 
there are businesses that are uh, kind of incremental improvement to stuff that exists already. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that implies a certain type of marketing approach and sales approach and ramp and capital required to get the job done, in part because convincing customers to do something that's evolutionary is maybe not that hard. If, if, if your widget has better price performance than the prior generation widget, and you can prove it, you can probably sell a bunch of widgets. And so that's not a bad place to be at all, but it's an important distinction from something that's truly revolutionary. The revolutionary things are often selfishly as an investor with a portfolio of companies, more interesting venture bets, because if they work, they can be really, really large, but they're also riskier, right, by definition. Um, and if you're building something that kind of hasn't been done before, it's a new consumer product or service that no one's ever thought of and no one's ever consumed, or it's a new enterprise-related product that is just fundamentally different than how things work today, um, understanding what that implies from a go-to-market standpoint and what the time will likely be to convince the universe that your way is the better way is super important. Uh, and, and it's important not to ignore that when you're pitching investors on how you're going to get from where you are today to where you want to be. Size. How, how, you know, this idea of, do you guys talk about TAM in this environment? And like, you know, on one hand, I kind of ignore addressable market when I'm talking to early stage entrepreneurs, especially if it's a pretty revolutionary idea because often the markets don't exist yet or no one really knows how big the market could be because no one's ever done this thing before. That said, um, and this is an obvious point, but I think an important one, it's a lot easier to be 5% of a really big thing than 50% of a small thing. It's just hard to get 50% share of anything when there are incumbent, either incumbent vendors or incumbent alternatives. I meet, because of my kind of commerce background and some of the investments I've made, I meet entrepreneurs who are starting kind of next gen brands all the time, just as an example. Um, how many people in this room are doing consumer related businesses? Got it, and the rest are B2B things. Um, on the consumer front, so I meet these startup brands all the time. You guys have probably heard of many of them. One, one of the more successful over the last couple of years that has some brown roots is Casper. Everyone knows Casper, right? Great company. Um, there are, in New York, where I spend a lot of time, hundreds of others. Ollie for dog food, Away for luggage, Rockets of Awesome for kids' clothing. I could list 20 of them. Um, brands are tough on this dimension because even if you have just designed and launched this great new direct-to-consumer kids clothing brand, there are still a gazillion alternative kids clothing brands, no matter how good yours is. Which doesn't mean you can't build an important multi-million dollar company that's valuable, but it does mean you're unlikely to have big share. Because there are just, the, 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 there is really, and it gets to my last point, uh, my next point, no defensibility per se. There, there's nothing that prevents someone from uh, deciding they no longer want to buy your thing and they want to buy someone else's thing. And I think that's important to understand as you're pitching how big your thing might be. And then competition, um, this, th there always will be competition in the consumer world, almost always, with the exception of businesses that have true network effects, like a LinkedIn or like a Facebook, which are great but few and far between. In the B2B world, of course there's competition, but from my own experience at Profit Logic, I got to tell you, like, monopolies are way more fun, right? Like, it's hard enough to build a company. It's even harder if you have to, like, compete with another really good vendor and fight it out on price. Um, and so, like, sure, monopolies are illegal. So what do I mean by that? It's super important to have something that is unique enough that you can position yourself as different than what other people do. Um, and so that when big enterprise customers are doing their analysis to figure out whether they need your thing, they aren't calling up Forrester or Gardner and finding out that there are seven other vendors which also claim to do the exact same thing, some of whom are part of Oracle and IBM and Adobe and Salesforce and have big sales teams and big marketing budgets, and even if their stuff is less good than your stuff, they're telling it much more loudly. That's a rough place to be. When we built ProfitLogic, no one was doing what we were doing. We were like literally the only game in town. Now it was disruptive. It was like this crazy thing for retailers to entrust a group of math geeks with their data off-site 
to go help them figure out how to make merchandising decisions. That was like antithetical to the whole ethos of big retail at the time. Um, and so our challenge was convincing these big retailers that this was okay and good and valuable. But what we didn't have to do is convince them to buy our thing versus Oracle's thing or IBM's thing, because Oracle and IBM didn't have a thing. And that made a huge difference in, our, in, in the time it took to get successful, in the runway we had, and ultimately our ability to build a big company and sell it to someone like Oracle. So let's talk about this thing, differentiation. Um, I guess I've kind of made the point. Um, whether it is a consumer business or, a, or an enterprise business, um, like be unique at something. I think it's fundamentally important and it ties, whoops, and it ties to this next idea, which is defensibility. Um, I'm really hung up on this point. And I think defensibility can come from a bunch of places. Sometimes defensibility comes only because once you get big, you will be the best alternative because there are network effects. And LinkedIn, we were investors in LinkedIn. LinkedIn's a great example of that. Like today, you don't go to a different, I assume, professional network site to go look up people and figure out who they are and who they're connected to. Um, and that's sort of inherent in that model. That wasn't obvious early on at LinkedIn that they would be able to achieve it, but it was sort of straightforward that if they achieved it, it was unlikely there was gonna be a number two. So that is a source of defensibility. That's a rare one. These other things are all sort of more often the case, which is real intellectual property, like something unique and different that was hard to figure out and hard to do. That often comes from data. When, when I think about the advantage we had at ProfitLogic, it wasn't that our math and physics PhDs were smarter than someone else's math and physics PhDs. They, they may have been, they thought they were actually, but um, they, and we were sitting in Cambridge and hiring the best of the best from MIT and Harvard and that was all good, but I don't think that was really it. What gave us a huge advantage of profit logic is that my co-founder, the guy's, the, my friend's dad from Brown, had spent a decade before I joined him doing consulting to big retailers and brands and getting their data. And so we had 10 years of data from big retailers and brands and had done analysis on that data and built a bunch of algorithms and IP that you couldn't do unless you had that data. Now, it wouldn't take the next vendor 10 years to do what he did in 10 years because he wasn't trying hard to go fast. He was just a, a one-man band doing one project at a time. But it wouldn't take one year. And you can't walk into a big retailer, certainly in those days, and say, hi, I'm smart, will you send me your data? You have to convince them and you have to do a project and they have to want to give you the data and believe there's going to be value. And so we had a lead and that lead was rooted in data. And in fact, in that kind of business, and I think it's true in a lot of businesses, any of your businesses where you were ingesting data, um, that lead can get bigger over time, not smaller, because there is an experience curve effect. You guys familiar with that concept? Like learning curve, similar to the learning curve, where the more you do something, often the better the thing gets. And the only way to get better is to do more of it. And so the next vendor really can only ca catch up by having as many reps as you have. And that can be true in a consumer business as well as in a, an enterprise business. I think about Rent the Runway today. It's like fascinating concept to me. So Rent the Runway, for those of you that don't know, is a dress rental business. And we also do a subscription to fashion for everyday clothes. But just think about like dress rental is the easier way to think about it. Um, there were things we thought we knew when that company launched about like what kind of dresses consumers would want and how we would manage the process of sending a dress to a consumer, getting it back, cleaning it, making it look perfect and sending it out again, that after a thousand rentals, like we're totally different. Like we learned things in those first thousand rentals that we never occurred to us when we were, when the founders were sort of piloting the business and contemplating starting it. And a year later, after 10,000 rentals, we knew things that never occurred to us after 1,000. And a year later, after 100,000 rentals, guess what? Order of magnitude improvements in our operational efficiency because of the learnings. We've now exceeded, I don't know, 4 million rentals, 5 million rentals. Like, I can't imagine how someone catches up. And God forbid someone tries to start that business because the amount of capital you need to go do what we've done is pretty daunting. Um, that's experience curve, and it's really, really powerful. There are, just by the way, there are other sources of defensibility that can matter in businesses a lot, um, like relationships with vendors. It, what if you have a proprietary source of data or a proprietary source of supply of whatever your raw materials are? 
in the Rent the Runway case, we have relationships with vendors, these are luxury dress vendors, that won't sell other online rental or retail operations because of their sort of image and their ethos. And so we have this kind of fundamental advantage that they'll only sell their stuff to Neiman's and Saks and Barney's and us. That's a huge advantage also. So this kind of defensibility really, really matters. And then rapid iteration matters a lot. I suspect you guys talk a lot about that around here. Um, I am a huge believer in, and I, I know it sounds trite, but this whole idea of like trying things all the time and failing fast and iterating and improving and trying again. Um, I, you know, as an entrepreneur, probably, you know, to some extent, um, uh, I could have been better at this, but I'm very much a ready, fire, aim kind of person. Um, you just got to like do stuff and have a bias for action. Um, I, any, any, uh, well, wait, you guys are all undergrad ish, post undergrad, anybody? Yeah. Got it. Post undergrad, a lot of people. Got it. Anybody former management consultants or have been management consultants? Phew. Um, I was one also, and there's nothing wrong with management consultants, but I'm always reluctant to back an entrepreneur who's been like 10 years at a consulting firm. And they're so smart and their slides are great and they give great presentations. And so like they are compelling and you sit back as an investor you're like, yeah, that totally makes sense. And like, oh my God, they have this whole thing figured out. But I find that people that were willing to live inside a management consulting shop for 10 years and stomach that life tend to enjoy analysis and tend to be really good at analysis. And thinking through stuff is important and understanding your unit economics and how you're going to make money and all that kind of stuff is certainly important. But overanalyzing is the death of a startup. Like you just got to do stuff and it's often going to hurt. Um, I found in my profit logic days, um, having confidence in my co-founders that they could deliver allowed me to go make commitments that were insane. And I would just go out and make commitments to retailers and then come back and tell the team, here's what we got to do. And they would just go do it. Had we spent a bunch of time scoping these projects ahead of time, we never would have gotten them. It just wouldn't have happened. And or we would have put so many handcuffs on the requirements for the project that, the, that it wouldn't have worked the way it needed to work. So sometimes you got to just put yourself out there. You got to overcommit. And then you got to be willing to somehow find a way to overdeliver along the way. So e easy to say, really hard to do, and that's why team matters most. It all boils back to team. Make sense? Questions? Disagreements? All right. So that's all I got. I think we're I think we're moving to pitches. Make sense? Great. You don't have to clap. Um, so I don't know how we want to do the pitch stuff, but I'm happy to well, we sort of observe and comment. Okay. That they can, uh, uh, so we'll ask for volunteers. If we Great. have any volleunteers, we'll cold call. So, oh, even better. Um, grab some if, uh, paper and make some notes. We also we also invited them to uh, if they if they oops, don't lose your swag. No way. If they. Um, I, I told them that we didn't want to start a pitch with a title slide and, and all that kind of stuff, that it's a little more conversational. But yep. sometimes you would actually expect an entrepreneur to show you a slide if there was something that the slide helped to convey about the, uh, the, the, the Slide, whiteboard, whatever works. Slide or whiteboard. We totally. have a few of those. Yep. So uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of up to you. I mean, so you, it would be, I mean, you. Why don't you describe a couple of ways that ventures interact with a venture capitalists? Sure. I mean, for, for early stage opportunities, like the stuff you guys are doing, um, these meetings take a variety of forms, but it's anything from over a cup of coffee to over a beer to like in our office formal presentation. Like it really just depends. It depends in part on just physically where you are and where we meet and, in, and what's most convenient and in part on what you're most comfortable with. Um, uh, I actually think um, if I were in your shoes, it is uh, slightly better to meet an investor casually and not really, I mean, you're always pitching, but sort of like I, I, I think the kind of approach of you know, asking for advice 
and getting feedback is a great way to get the ball rolling. I have meetings like that all the time. And the reality is, as an investor, we're, we're given advice because we want to know if there's a deal there. We want to know if there's something there we want to do at some point down the road. And we want an early look at some great entrepreneur who may have an idea that even six months or a year from now might be something we want to do. So uh, I know you're actually pitching, and you know I'm actually interested or maybe interested. But the idea of keeping it casual and getting feedback is a pretty good way to get in the door. Um, and a pretty good, I, I think, the entrepreneurs that can carry off a kind of face-to-face -face casual discussion and sort of logically make their points in a compelling way and answer good answer questions in that format, um, I think that's often more effective than the stand-up presentation. It may lead to a broader stand-up presentation, but it's not a bad way to get started. So I like that idea. Okay. So I think the invitation there is to maybe dispense with slides and start with conversation. I think whichever you feel more comfortable with, I'm open to. Okay. And I'm <coughs> One, one thing that, that uh, we talked about earlier today was uh, we, we did some practice pitches yesterday with slides for the mm -hmm. first time in B-Lab. And one of the things that came up was how formulaic should an approach to an investor be. And so I've sort of impressed this notion that, you know, maybe, maybe start with the four corners of the, of the deal, like the puzzle, sort of get, get the whole thing out quickly in summary. Make sure you describe a problem. Make sure you describe how big the problem is, solution, uh, competitive advantage, and exit. Not not uh, business exit, but stop talking kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. But so some of the some of the groups felt like that was um, too much uh, of a bridle in the mouth in a way that that, that it, it sort of hampered creativity. And so one question I would have for you on behalf of these guys is, do you want to have do you, is is a is a an approach to an investor, a place to innovate, or do you, do you hew to a more formulaic approach? Um, I think they're right. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think there is a formula that matters. I think there's fundamentals of what you want to communicate that are pretty common across pitches. I think the way in which you do that doesn't really matter. I think what matters, especially in an early stage pitch where it's really pitch and there's not a lot of data about the success of the business to rely on, is you communicating why you're going to be successful at this. That's what I'm looking for. There's a little bit about what the business is. Um, the more disruptive it is, the less I'm interested in the business and the more I'm interested in who this person is and why it is this person's likely to be successful. And let me talk about that a little bit. Uh, this question often comes up. Like, the idea of a great team seems like, duh, of course you want to have a great team. So what, what's great team mean? Well, part of what it means is that like, there's a reason why you guys should be the ones to do this. And so, so why? Because you know something other people don't know from your own experience. You studied something. You did research in this area. You stumbled into this insight. But there's an insight in there. And it's an insight gleaned from real world playing around in this playground, whatever that playground is. That's important to communicate. Um, I think it's really important, if you can, to communicate w w without doing this in sort of a self-aggrandizing way, to, to communicate your personal story. Like, why you just as an entrepreneur? What, where do you come from? What makes you tick? Why do you love this? Why is it you wake up every day and this is like the only thing you can think about? Um, and like, this is it for you. I think that's super important also. Um, it, I, w I will just say as an aside, and this is maybe a separate topic for another time, when you are ultimately raising money for your businesses, I feel very strongly that you should expect to do the same level of diligence and understanding on a potential investor that they're doing on you. This, especially at a seed stage or A round, this is someone you're going to live with for probably a long time. Most of these things take eight to 10 years, start to finish when they work. Um, and so the person that you choose to partner with better be someone that you feel you can learn from, who has relevant domain knowledge that can help you build your business, and that's like just a good person, like someone who's not going to stab you in the back, someone who like is going to be there through the, the ups and the downs, someone who maybe has lived it not just as an investor but as an entrepreneur, and they know things don't always go up into the right. Like all that stuff matters, and you shouldn't feel, despite the fact that it often feels this way, like the power is all on the other side of the table. It's just not. The reality to all of us as investors is that the scarce commodity is you guys. We are all, there's way too many of us 
and we're trying to find great entrepreneurs with great ideas. That is what, that's it. Um, like, you should expect we show up on time, and we don't keep you waiting, and we're not jerks, and all those kind of things. And if any of those things aren't true, if I were you, I'd walk out the door. Because, like, that's not the kind of person you want to hang out with for the next 10 years. So, my two cents. So, we, we, I'll ask you one other yeah. question, and then I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I'm filling some dead air so that you guys can get your courage up to do this, all right? Because we're going to come back around and, and, ask you to, and ask you to pitch. But we had, a, you and I had a very brief dialogue in uh, email back on this team thing, and, and, I, and I mentioned to you that I have trouble myself in a teaching capacity uh, talking to students about uh, how important team is, because I hear many times uh, from students like, I, I don't have any experience. Right. How, can I, how can I be the great team that, that Scott, Friends needs to see, Scott Friend needs to see in order to write a check there's a, there's a weird disconnect between youth and experience and the need to be a great team. How do we solve that problem for, for these guys? It, right. I mean, look, the, the, cert, the, the Mark Lorries of the world at Jet, he started diapers.com prior and sold it to Amazon for 500 million bucks. Like, he had a track record. And he also happens to be a super compelling entrepreneur. Jen Hyman at Rent the Runway didn't have a track record. She was at Harvard Business School. She had you know, gone to Harvard undergrad, she spent a couple years at Starwood. She like had no track record really of anything. Um, uh, but she, uh, she, her passion for the idea was contagious. Her thought process around why there was a huge problem, why that problem was unlikely to be solved by traditional solutions, why this innovative new solution of rental actually could work, all sort of were compelling. And in that case, just one example, but this is again an example of someone without real experience, her bias for action was contagious to me. What do I mean by that? There are, in, this is now back in 2009, but like particularly in that era, even today, there are people with ideas for online businesses of various types who want to raise money and build an app or build a site, or build a something. What Jen decided to do was go run trunk shows. Like before building anything, she found a way to assemble 100 dresses between her friends and her and some that they bought, and she ran trunk shows at Harvard and Yale sororities to figure out would women rent dresses? What would they pay? What happens to a dress after a weekend of sorority parties and fraternity parties, and can it be cleaned? Those things that happen all that stuff that are fundamental to deciding if this is even a business worth building. That's what she did. And like none of that required experience of any type. It just required entrepreneurial instinct. And that instinct got communicated when I first met her. Fantastic. OK, so that's a partial solution to the inexperience. Just, you just overwhelm the listener with, uh, with uh, passion, organization, and progress or something. So all, all those things. Yeah. And, and personal story. I mean, I think, like, feel comfortable, even if you think it's not meaningful, sharing what makes you tick. Because I think that's a big part of the process, too. You may be surprised at how much that engages the investor on the other side of the table. All right. So who wants to? Oh, Jacob's hand comes up. Let's do it. Let's do it. Where do you want me? Maybe I should go on this side, you since want, you're facing you the other way. Kind of slide no. stuff or, OK. All right, I'm going to so, switch. <laughs> Let me, let's, uh, let's just, what are you going to do? You're gonna I'm just going to sit this way so you can face that way. Does that make sense? That's fine. I'm going to be talking to you, though. I know, but that way you're not, that way you're back, <laughs> not to the rest of the audience. Do you want him to stand or sit like a, at a coffee shop? You, what do you want to do? Uh, it doesn't matter. Pick. I'll sit. <laughs> Thank you. Just gonna, we're just going to put it into the coffee shop. All right, cool. How's that? And uh, so that we don't, I'm going to just uh, do a video here. So that we're going to turn it off all the way. Maybe I should move then. Maybe I'll move over here. You, see, you can stay where you are, okay. I think. Just, is it better for the video if I'm over here? Does it matter? Oh, it doesn't matter. OK, cool. You got my good side? OK. 
All right. Okay. You bet. All right. Hi, Scott. Um, my name is Jacob Kumar. I'm a Brown PhD in neuroengineering. And together with Rachel Lowenstein, we're starting a company called Fresh Level 52. And the problem that we're addressing is that there's farmers across this nation and worldwide that are being affected by changing weather patterns, scarcity of water, um, over fertilization of their soil and pollution of their soil, um, as well as other supply chain distribution problems uh, that continue to grow as, as our population gets larger um, and as all those other factors change. So we're working on a technology company that develops indoor vertical farming solutions um, to grow food indoors aeroponically um, to fit a, a local need um, in, in various urban markets across the US. And so we have a sort of a, a full turnkey solution that um, uses uh, a proprietary uh, technology that uh, manages uh, an aeroponic growing system using um, a, a big data backend to ingest all the sensor data um, and then make decisions on the fly to, um, to adjust the growing system to produce food faster and more efficiently. And um, so our turnkey solution is available. The idea is that uh, lo local farmers that exist already, field farmers that exist, could purchase the system and put it into a, an existing facility building that they already have or they could build new. Um, and uh, aspiring urban farmers and existing urban farmers, including in the cannabis market as well, could leverage either the entire system or the technology piece of the, of the system um, to improve the efficiency of their existing, of their existing farm. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a PhD in, in neuroengineering, um, and my experience is in building control systems. Um, my inspiration for this project was actually after I accidentally clicked on a banner ad um, on a website <laughs> and um, had a, somebody try to sell an, an audio book screaming at me about hydroponics and sort of uh, learned about that. I had this aspiration to make the world's first hydroponic whiskey. Um, so I grew some corn in my basement, um, but my Providence 1875 basement was too short. And uh, the corn wound up growing taller than the basement before it could germinate, so that project kind of got terminated. But that sort of is what inspired me to, uh, to start this company. And uh, together with, with Rachel, who has a background in business and, and in fundraising, um, I think that we uh, make a great team, and uh, we're, we're very ready to, um, to get started. What, what's your background, Rachel? Uh, I spent five years as a nonprofit fundraiser, so venture fundraising with a nonprofit fundraising. I have an undergraduate business degree and psychology degree, and I just received my master's from Brown. Oh, cool. And how'd you guys meet? Actually, I moved into 1875. And there was like corn everywhere? Yeah, there was corn everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, great, really good pitch, by the way. Thanks. That was a like, great way to kick it off. Can I ask you a few questions? Absolutely. Do you want to, is that what we're, I mean, I can critique the pitch, but I actually have a few questions first, just about the business. So um, how is this different than like freight farms and a bunch of the big box approaches that I've seen for indoor farming? I feel like there's seven or eight players in the market right now doing something similar. Yeah, so, um, so, so th you've covered kind of the two ends of the spectrum, which is freight farms and then players like Aero Farms. And, yeah, um, that's the one I was thinking of, okay. yep. So, um, the, on, the freight, on the freight farms end of the market, um, that, that type of solution where it's a, um, a fully built out sort of modular solution um, isn't profitable. And the reason that it's not profitable is because the size constraints in which they're operating in make it so that the initial capital cost is very high. Relative to the output. Relative to the output, exactly. Yeah. And so the idea is that- it, paybacks, it pays back eventually, right? They can, no? it, it, probably not. <laughs> Um, they're having a lot of problems with returns, yeah. and um, so, but the, the key part of our, of the, the, it's, it's kind of a, a two-faceted solution. One is that um, we use, uh, a, our, our system is built mostly of COTS, low-cost COTS items um, that are uh, uh, easily attainable and bring the initial capital cost down, but the other major uh, piece of it is that the, the system is fully modular, so that if you have a barn, a, a barn, or you're building just a, a prefab steel building. You can outfit that that building with low-cost growing units, but all of your fixed costs are the same as they are in that in that container that you're buying from freight farms. Um, and the the larger players like like Aero Farms, um, and the, there's many of them. Yeah. Um, they are uh, companies that their major play is in IP. 
And um, it seems that those companies aren't able to be profitable because their solutions are fully um, uh, uh, prefabbed kind of in enormous initial capital cost in those solutions. And so um, the, the cost per square footage to build out those, to build out those facilities, uh, from, the, from the numbers that we've seen, it's going to take them seven or eight years to make payback. So, so the big difference is your cost per foot to get started is lower? Cost per foot to get started is lower. And why? So, because we're using, our, our, our solution that we've built is using all common off the shelf items. Using solutions that are, that are cheaper per square foot to build than, uh, than plastic injection methods. And, and, and is, that, is, is there a reason why someone else couldn't use the components you're using to build it more cost effectively? So the, the, main, the, the main secret sauce of our system is in the data aggregation and, and analytics of it. So we have very low cost sensors that are baked into our, um, into our growing, in, that set up our growing environment um, that cover a, a plethora of different, there's seven or eight different things that are being measured. Um, and so, but because we're using all low cost sensors and, and, um, and low cost wireless equipment and stuff like that, that just doesn't compete with, with what's currently out there on the market. Um, that's, I think that we'll be able to collect enough data to improve the efficiency of growing um, particular products, that that's what's really gonna provide a competitive edge. And is there a way to go prove that in a small way? I think so. So right now, um, our MVP is, is almost done. Um, we have a prototype uh, sensor network system. We've, we've built other growing uh, apparatus. Um, to, we, we've grown mixed greens and and all that sort of stuff. But I think the way that we're going to prove it is that our, our sensor network is being deployed right now to three cannabis farms. And we're going to take data from those cannabis farms prior to using our system and compare it with, with the installation of our system and say, hey, look, uh, you know, we, we, we had this reduction. We had this 25% reduction in labor because we're not, we're not making these manual measurements. We're, right. You know, all, and, and, and we're able to reduce our grow time or our product is better or whatever. So. Got it. Good. Makes sense. Good job. Thanks. Um, so some feedback, does that make sense? Um, so a couple things. Um, I think in a category where there are existing players who haven't really worked yet, the bar is a little higher to prove that your approach well. Mm. And I'm not an expert in this field at all, but for whatever reason, I've seen like six or seven of these pitches and passed on freight farms a few times for exactly the reasons you described. Like the, the, the return on capital for those boxes seemed really hard to achieve unless this thing was like crushing it in terms of productivity and you could sell every item that popped out the door, right? Yeah. Um, so I think the bar is relatively hard, high for you guys to have some data to prove that your approach just fundamentally operates with different economics that exist, than existing approaches, number one. And number two, that uh, um, the way you're achieving those better unit economics isn't easily replicable by someone else. Um, and I think you began to tell a story on that front that's pretty credible. Right. And the more that story is about, we've got a unique way to take low cost centers and, and capture the data, and that's not trivial, and whatever your PhD is in allows you to like figure that out in a way other people can't, is a good start. Yep. What would be even better is that the more you do that, the more your approach gets better and better. And so you're sort of building a lead based on the reps at that over time. Um, Third piece of the puzzle that wasn't obvious from what you pitched, I think I know the answer, but um, is are you a branded grower that's going to sell your output or are you selling technology to growers? We're selling technology. Right. And so I would just make that clear also okay. because a lot of the players on the market, so Freight Farms is selling technology to growers. Some of the other guys like Aero are growers right. and they're partnering with Kroger and trying to put big facilities next to Kroger to be the supplier of basil, yeah. right? Yeah, and got them greens, right. And that stuff tastes pretty good, actually, um, from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. They all show up with demos with like their product. Um, uh, so I think that's important to kind of weave into it also. And then um, this, this <laughs> may be different for different invest investors. This maybe is like, because we're Bain Capital um, and more of a big institutional group with a venture firm. Um, I think the cannabis thing is tricky. Mm -hmm. like, there are investors who won't touch it. Um, and so I know you're not growing pot and that's like your business and I know it's legal, so like in certain places and so that's all fine, but there are investors who won't touch it because our investors, big institutions like Brown and Princeton and Harvard and 
CalPERS and State of Ohio and others don't want us doing stuff that's drugs or gambling. And so um, I think if your test case that proves the point is just pot, I think that's less good than if it also was like spinach. Okay. Great. Makes sense? One other question I had was, um, do you think that it's good or bad that I really didn't dive into the financials of the business at all? I mean, I think it's good because I didn't ask you. So I think, and so this is, this I think is an important point. One of the things I loved about this pitch was you didn't tell me too much and you didn't sort of like nervously volunteer all sorts of information that I didn't ask for. I think if we were actually having a cup of coffee and we we're gonna like sit down for 45 minutes or something, I would have asked you more about how the math works, more about how much capital you need to get started, more about how much you think you wanna raise in a seed round and how much runway that buys you and why that's enough. Um, and I'll make a comment about that in a second. But I like the fact that you didn't sort of like just, just like spit out a whole bunch of info that I wasn't ready to listen to yet. So I thought you handled that really well. Okay, thanks. Uh, on that point of, of how much money you're raising though, one thing to keep in mind, um, I think like people's idea on how much seed funding they need is often random. And what I like to hear is that, and, and it's often, I shouldn't say it's random, it's often rooted in what they think seed investors are willing to invest. Um, which I think is the wrong way to go about it. Um, what I like to hear is that you know there are the following milestones that you know you need to achieve to raise a successful A round. And you believe it's gonna take you 18 months to achieve those milestones um, with some level of conservatism. And as a result, you want 24 months of runway. And 24 months of runway based on the team you're gonna to need to achieve those milestones and when those hires are gonna happen and whatever capital you need to buy stuff along the way means you need to raise $850,000, whatever that number is. But that, does the logic make sense? Like it, it, and the reason that's so important is that one of the common things that happens to seed stage startups that is really a drag is the false negative. The false negative is you're actually on the right path. There's a thing in there that could be a really good business and you are running low on capital before you have enough time to prove enough to raise the next round. And it's not because, as I, it's not because you're wrong, your thesis was wrong, it's because it just took longer than you thought. And so I'm, all, I'm a big believer in raising more not less than a seed round for those reasons. Nice job. Yeah, one other thing on that front, you know, most, most investors, unless they're deep in a domain and have like a PhD in something like really narrow, like something that, like your arena, um, not that your arena is so narrow, but you know what I mean, don't, aren't PhDs. And so I wouldn't be shy about your, your academic cred and why, that, and, and why that training has given you some sort of unfair advantage to do what you're doing. Uh, hands. Let's go all the way in the back. Hi, Scott. I'm Vishnu. Hey, Vishnu. How are nice you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Um, so I'm a student at Brown studying applied math and biology, and I'm working with a team of surgeons and engineers at Brown uh, to build the third eye of neurosurgery. The third? Eye of neurosurgery. Right now, neurosurgeons are blind during surgery. With their hands in the brain, they rely on images taken the day before uh, for proper guidance. Uh, but as they remove the skull and progressing with the surgery, those images are completely obsolete. And without proper guidance, updated guidance throughout the surgery, these surgeons, number one, can't be precise with, with what they're doing. And because of that, they go very slowly. Uh, and as these surgeons are going very slowly, patients are on the table for, for a greater amount of time and there's greater risk involved. Uh, so it's not just nice to have, but it's actually essential for these surgeons to have that proper guidance system when they're working on the most important organ in the brain, uh, most important organ in the body, which is the brain. And that's what Predictive Optics, the company I'm building, is creating. We're creating an augmented reality-based imaging system that, would that allows surgeons to, uh, with continuous, uh, uh, a visualization actually see brain tumors, so these brain tumors will pop up at them and be highlighted, uh, and see uh, 
blood flow visualization and uh, brain structure. Brain structure. Re real time while they're real operating. Real time. So this is, you know, neurosurgeries cases are they can last up to nine to twelve hours. Wow. Uh, and you know, when you're using an image from the from the day before, uh, you know, things change, right? So that so the tissue structure is not the same. Uh, and the way we're doing this, our real secret sauce, is using deep learning. So uh, the uh, there's a there's a laser light that's scattered onto the brain, and the camera, the way we're analyzing the laser, the backscattered laser light, um, is has never been done before. And uh, the technology costs one thousand dollars to make, uh, and we're we're gonna we're looking to sell it for you know around one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So um, the margins uh, can be really incredible with this. Yeah. And is there some sort of approval process for this kind of device? Yeah, so our immediate focus is just amassing a lot of data, uh, beginning clinical trials at Rhode Island Hospital with some surgeons, and uh, we're trying to uh, get FDA uh, approval, which is the 510K uh, approval. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a little bit more on your background. So I'm a third year undergrad at Brown, studying applied math and biology. And I have a background in optics, so uh, previously I was working on uh, non-invasive blood glucose assessment. Um, and right now I'm working with a bio-optics professor, um, working with uh, a deep learning professor at Brown, and then a couple of uh, surgeons at Rhode Island Hospital to make this happen. And what, um, w w what do you know that confirms in your mind that it is a need to have, not a nice to have, and that you can charge 150000 bucks for it? Yeah. Um, so when you're progressing with uh, a really complicated surgery, um, you know, it's, uh, things really change, right, uh, constantly throughout the surgery. And these, it's really important for these surgeons to have a, price, a precise understanding of where exactly tumor regions are. So when they're uh, removing a tumor, right now what actually happens, um, because there's no proper guidance, uh, surgeons will keep patients awake during a brain tumor mm -hmm. section. Uh, and when the, so let's say the tumor is in a region of the brain that's really important for speech, um, they'll have the patient actively speak throughout the surgery. Right. And when the patient starts slurring their words, that's when the, t well, that's when the surgeon knows, oh, I've taken too much, uh, too much tissue. Um, and that's, you know, after the fact. Uh, this would be, you know, completely updated. Uh, so they'll have a precise, they'll actually be able to see the tumor and see how much they're taking. taking. So they won't have to you know, close up the surgery when the patient's uh, slurring their words, and then the next day go back and do the surgery. So this would really save, you know, two hours, according to our conversations with neurosurgeons that we're working with, this would save roughly two hours. On but would it improve outcomes? Exactly, yeah. So it would allow surgeons to be more precise. Right now there's no visualization of what's going on. Uh, but so is there belief today by surgeons that they're that the outcomes are worse. It's one thing if it takes longer now, yeah. and shorter is probably better on a whole bunch of dimensions, yeah. but are the outcomes worse, or do they believe that they get as just as good an outcome, they just have to be super precise and it takes longer? So the outcomes, uh, from my conversations with, with these surgeons, should be better. Um, with a better understanding of what's going on, right, and yep. completely updated, um, it, I mean, it should be better. Got it, cool, nice job. Thank you. So, so couple comments. So, I know nothing about this arena. So, I'm kind of a. I, I wouldn't be the guy you'd be having coffee with to pitch this, right? Just because you'd want to talk to someone who's a healthcare device investor. Um, but in general thoughts, I thought the pitch was great. Actually, I think your kind of involvement in the arena, both the prior work around optics and then the current stuff you're doing, makes a ton of sense. Um, I think the the value prop sounds right. Um, it sounds like a little soft, and I think you can make it harder from an economic standpoint. You sort of anchored on, you know, patients are on the table a really long time, and this would make it faster. Um, more than, I, I, think, I think improved outcomes is like a more compelling argument. Uh, and speed may have something to do with outcomes, because less other bad stuff goes on if it's five hours versus 10 hours. But um, I, if, if you can be more concrete about the fact that you know, 30% of the time um, A, B, and C happens in brain surgeries because doctors don't have up to the second, you know, data on what's going on there. That, to me, is more compelling. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that you didn't hit that I think is probably worth hitting is, like, 
if, if this is such a big problem, you know, there are lots of scaled medical device companies in the universe that when there are big untapped opportunities are working on things. So who else is working on this? And why is it that your team, the people you're collaborating with at Brown, kind of have a unique insight or advantage in getting this done? Or why is it that no one else is working on this? Is it because it's not a big problem? Probably not. Is it because even if you solve it, there's only 50 hospitals in the world that need it? That'd be worth knowing. Um, or is there some other reason why? Make sense? Yeah. Awesome. I got it. If I may, just yeah. one, one comment uh, for, and for you to reflect on, and then one question. So when he asked you, um, what, what's, uh, what evidence do you have that uh, going faster is important or something? I forget exactly yeah. what the question was. To me, what I wanted to say, Vishnu, was surgeons have told me that. Bingo. Just yeah. li literally that sentence. Yeah. Because what, what he said was, it was kind of like, I think, or I've found, and I've done this, and I've done that. But if you said, a surgeon told me, and then you, then you, so I don't know, Scott, if that's... A hundred percent agree. hundred percent agree. I mean, you, you're super credible in how you answered the question, so I thought, like, it was all good. But when I asked that question, you went back to, here's what goes on in a surgery, right. um, as opposed to, I've talked to 15 surgeons... Uh, and they've all said the same thing. Yeah. And here's what it is. Right. So that was one, one observation. The other was, and I, I struggle again, and this may not be something that you can talk authoritatively about because it's this that medical, medical device thing, but uh, you know, the customer for this, and the customer for many sort of B2B kinds of things is not necessarily the end user, which is the surgeon. And so is it important for, for someone like Vishnu to get out ahead of the market challenge of selling to an institution, do they, does he need to talk about that? Or is it more kind of value prop for the end user and the patient and all that kind of stuff? Um, uh, the right investor for this would understand that ecosystem super well. You probably do also. But who the payers really are, what the, appro what the FDA approval process looks like, are you selling this device to the hospital, do you market it to the doc, all, all those sort of things. Right. What, 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 how far along in the approval process do you need to be before you can commercialize it? Um, the right investor is going to know those things and ask you some good questions on that front to see if you know them. So yeah, I do think it's important. Um, I wouldn't volunteer it like right out of the gate, okay. um, but I think it's going to be fundamental to the conversation yeah. with someone who understands the space. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Right. Good job. So yeah. Great. Is this, uh, to, to come and do it. Are you awesome. guys going together? Uh, yeah. Let's do it. All right. Something we can all understand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's actually, actually, actually feel like we're at a table, you know? All right, cool. Hey, how are you? Dylan, nice to meet you. Dylan, nice to meet you. Okay. Um, so we're Brevity, a direct-to-consumer backpack company. Uh, our aim is to be uh, the most versatile um, everyday carry solution. Um, so a bit about our background, our story. Two years ago, uh, I was heading abroad to Hong Kong. Uh, Brandon was trying to get into design school. Uh, and I was searching for a camera backpack that could hold a laptop, a binder, um, and my camera, um, which I found to be a quite simple need. Um, <laughs> I hit up Brandon because uh, Brandon is uh, much better at Googling things than I am. Um, we were unable to find a bag that could meet these needs. Um, and uh, Brandon was trying to get into RISD at the time. So um, we hit the drawing board. Uh, Brandon taught himself how to sew, uh, bought a sewing machine for $15 at the local savers down the road. And uh, we really hit the ground running. Um, we launched on Kickstarter uh, to launch to an audience to really validate our idea. Uh, we researched how to uh, do a, an effective product launch and how to get successful funding. Uh, and here we are two years later. Um, we are about to launch our new line of bags and I'll have Brandon talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so uh, originally we started out in photography. Uh, it was a market that we understood. Dylan's a photographer. We are moving into a much larger market, so we're moving into the commuter bag market. Uh, what we found was Dylan's same problem with 
being unable to find the right kind of camera backpack uh, is also seen within the commuter space. So our bags have a removable insert, uh, which was something that was, did not exist on the market. Uh, and we are implementing that same system in our commuter bag. So we found that uh, like on the Greenbush line going into Boston, uh, a lot of people would have their lunchbox, they would have you know, whatever they're bringing, their gym clothes in a separate bag. And it's like this whole thing where uh, you know, all you need is a modular bag, something that can remove and you can take it on the go. Um, we've developed a very strong supply chain. Uh, we are currently sourcing our bags through the same company that North Face and uh, Herschel uh, are sourcing through, and they also act as our financial institution. Um, our team consists of myself, uh, I currently am a master's of industrial design student at RISD, and I former, formerly worked uh, as a venture investor in New York City. For whom? Laconia Capital Group. Uh, Dylan is a venture for America fellow. Cool. Uh, and our other brother, who's our third partner, uh, is currently at the New York Fed and will be leaving in the coming months to come on full time also. Great. And, and where's the business at from a sales standpoint? Um, so this year, uh, we're projected to do um, 875,000. That's great. Yeah. Like, that's like how many units? Uh, so we sell, um, let's see, uh, uh, it's like 100 to 150 a month. It works out to somewhere right around the 5,000 unit mark. Got it. And, that, and that, how much of that have you done already? This year? Um, we've done about um, 2,000, I think 2,300 2, units. Got it. So almost half the year yeah. accomplished yeah. already. Got um, it. It is worth noting that we're, um, we're planning on launching another Kickstarter. Yeah. Uh, which For this new line. Yes. New line. Um, we're, uh, and we view that as a, a real slingshot opportunity. Because you're only selling the camera related bag today? Yes. Got uh, it. Three bags. Three bags. Got it. Cool. Awesome. Nice job. Um, so, b b bunch of thoughts. F first one is, and you guys probably weren't prepared for this, but like any product business where it's actually built, like bring the product, <laughs> right? <laughs> like I, I don't want to imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I figured you had one nearby. Yeah. So Got this it. is actually uh, the first bag we launched with. So um, the idea was that it has <coughs> um, this removable insert, which is accessible through the front, and then um, you can either take it out through the front, and um, like fits like my camera, Super and cool. put a bunch of yeah. in there as well. Yeah, that's um, neat. And then this comes out, so it converts to a normal backpack. Uh, and then it has the space for your laptop and cool. some binders. And, like that. and um, can you talk a little bit about how you guys have, in addition to Kickstarter, how you found customers? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so you, um, it's been a, a massive learning process. Um, when we first started out, uh, we really didn't have any knowledge on where to find customers, uh, digital marketing, content marketing, influencer marketing. Um, and those channels we've really um, tried to expand on. So um, we've written pieces of content that have went viral. Um, we've done a lot of um, giveaways that have garnished a huge mailing list for us. Uh, we have a large social media following, um, things like that. Got it. And what? And so, what's customer acquisition cost today? Uh, Thirty-three dollars. Thirty-three bucks, blended, mm -hmm. all in, not just paid. Um, that is uh, mostly paid. That's mostly paid. Yeah, that would be like our uh, digital marketing. Got it. Got it. And what? How much does the bag cost? Uh, this specific model is one forty-five. Yep. Um, our most popular model is one sixty-five, and then one eighty-five. Got it. And gross margins are what? Seventy-four uh, percent. That's great. That's great. And are you thinking about wholesale also, or just direct? Uh, we are. Uh, we've been approached by several chains. Um, we're very hesitant with wholesale. Uh, we wanted to be the right strategic partner. And how have you funded it so far? Uh, we're all bootstrapped. All bootstrapped. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. We've won a few uh, business plan competitions, and we've been a member of, I believe, five incubators and accelerators so far. None of which have taken equity. Yeah, that's great and smart. 
and, and when um, so when we launched, it was really important that, to us that we learned as much as possible. So uh, each of us going to three different schools, we all became uh, very entrenched in our local entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem. Great, nice job. Yeah. Um, really good. So. Um, couple thoughts. I mean, I think, you know, you guys obviously have a real thing going. Um, uh, there, you know, I, I have lots of questions over kind of how you rise above the fray in sort of the general purpose commuter bag market versus this more kind of niche camera bag world where I think it's a little bit easier to garner a following because people are searching for something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when it, when it comes time to go buy search terms around backpacks, and messenger bags and whatever the you know like it's a big universe and there's lots of people bidding and so those are really expensive terms and it's harder to rise above the fray but you get to draft off this nice following that you built already so i think there's a way um, but i think you got to be really cognizant of the fact that that market is way more crowded um, and probably way more expensive to do acquisition in um, uh, i love that you guys have done this on kickstarter and are doing another Kickstarter campaign. I don't know if you've looked into Circle Up also. Do you know Circle Up? They're another crowdfunding platform. Kind of, sort of. Circle Up is a, it's crowdfunding for more professional investors of consumer businesses, only consumer businesses. And so you post your business on Circle Up. They're mostly your stage, like they have real revenue, mm -hmm. um, but they're trying to raise a million bucks or two million bucks for the next phase. Mm -hmm. And so it creates acts, you know, th this is a category where it's hard to find investors. Right, because there are not a lot of people that do early stage consumer products for a whole bunch of reasons in the venture world. And in the private equity world, people that do consumer products wait till there's meaningful EBITDA. Um, uh, and so Circle Up is trying to tackle this universe of how do you fund early stage innovations in the consumer world, whether it's food and beverage or you know, consumer durables or whatever. And so that may be a good platform for you guys. Um, I love that it's bootstrapped so far. Um, my, my biggest concern over, you heard my little shtick about directing consumer businesses earlier. Mm -hmm. um, my biggest concern with these is not that they're bad investments, it's that they raise too much money. Like if you build a 20 or $30 million um, bag business that's profitable, it's gonna be a home run for you guys, personally, unless you raise too much money. And often these companies, because they're direct to consumer, are pitching themselves as next gen internet businesses and raising lots of venture capital, and then your hands are tied. You know, candidly, Ra Casper, which is a great company and growing really fast, raised its last round at like a $500 million valuation on 70 million in revenue, real revenue, right? And growing and nicely profitable. But, you know, and we lo I've looked at all the rounds of Casper and they're great, it's a great team and they're doing a great job, but it's a mattress. And we've owned Sealy and Serta. And eventually mattress companies get valued like mattress companies, not like Facebook. And so if you raise too much money at too high a price, as entrepreneurs, your hands get tied by us. So Casper raised at 500 from some big institutional investors. They had an offer to sell the company this year to Target for a billion dollars. They said no. Maybe they said no because the entrepreneurs are like, we can build a $10 billion company. My guess is they said no because the guy that invested at 500 had a block. And if I invested, I'm not in the business of making two times my money. That's not even like an attaboy in my job, right? I'm trying to make five to 10 times my money. And so I'm shooting for the moon. Those entrepreneurs would have gotten, they would have crushed it at a billion dollar exit to target, right? It would have been hundreds of millions of dollars split amongst those four founders, but they couldn't say yes to that. And so that's the problem with too much venture money in these non-differentiated consumer businesses. I know not to say your product isn't differentiated, but you know what I mean. Um, but I love what you're doing. And raising some seed money or a couple million dollars of venture money to me makes all the sense in the world. I would just ensure that you're profitable, you get profitable or continue to be profitable on the back of that round. Mm -hmm. And then the playbook gets really interesting because if you're a $10 million business in a couple years with a couple million of EBITDA, there's a whole category of mid-market growth stage consumer investors who love to take like a 50% stake in the company, give you a bunch of liquidity and give you the resources to step on the gas even further. And that's like, that's the dream. Yeah. So great work. Thank you. Nice job. If I may. Yeah. Nice job. I, do, I wonder, so I listen to these guys a lot and, and um, I wonder if they could have had a stronger start 
and I want to I want to put this in front of you, Scott, and because. But I, I heard it, and he ended up drawing out of you some of the stuff that he needed to hear, I think. And so I wonder, so here's a, here's a consumer product investor who's had to have seen thousands of cats and dogs. And you kind of, it seems to me you could have started way stronger than you did with the following kind of thing. We have bootstrapped in two years. Mm -hmm. we're, we're at six-figure sales. Ramping to seven next year, almost for sure. Kickstarter one, Kickstarter, and like in 45 seconds, you've built to me tremendous credibility that I didn't hear until like minute six, seven, eight. Back to you. I to so you're 100 percent right. I kind of give the hall pass because, like, it came out eventually, and I like your. You had to pull. I no, I no. So I'm tor I'm torn about this. Candle, I think it's a really good debate because. Like, this isn't speed dating at the end of the day. Like, if this was a speed dating thing, like, then you're 100% right. And you guys have a ton of cred that did come out ultimately in the conversation. But it's not speed dating. It's like, we're having a cup of coffee. We're going to sit down for a half hour, an hour, try to get to know each other. And, you know, your sort of modesty around it is kind of endearing also. Like, I actually was shocked when I heard that you sold 875, 875K so far. And you're going to do 5,000 units this year. But I was like shocked in a really positive way. Like these guys have sort of done it the right way and they're not super self-promotional, uh, you know, and they're not trying to convince me that, you know, here's the $10 billion messenger bad market and we're gonna have 20% of it, right, right, right. right? So it all kind of worked for me, candidly, but I don't disagree with your point. If you like, you know, get the one chance to have a cup of coffee with, you know, uh, you know whoever God's gift to consumer investing is, and like you've got 30 seconds to kind of you know get their attention, you've done a lot that you could tick off pretty quickly, um, and so I, I think the point's well taken. And I think so. The reason why I, I chose to start off with the story was I was more aimed at like a coffee. Challenge. Yeah, that's fair. It, it was how I would talk if I was getting coffee with someone. I wouldn't lead off with you know like um, you know well, bootstraps revenue. You know that would yeah. kind of like be the like the ebb and flow of a conversation. Yeah. I, 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 would, I would note, though, a little bit maybe the kind of middle ground between the two points of view, that you're not, like, in a position to beg for capital, right? Because it may work. Like, there's something real here that's working, and I would feel confident about that and put that out there. This is, all, this is like a kind of an early growth stage investment. It's not as much a venture investment. There's no debate whether you guys can build product that consumers like. Um, or you know, or there's no debate whether you know how to develop a following and sell a bunch of units. The question is, really, for an investor, how big can it really be? And as a result, how much am I willing to pay for it? But, and, and, and that's a fair discussion for you to have with investors. But I would sort of frame it as, we're looking for growth capital. Because we think we're really onto something. We kind of know the process now. And we want to step on the gas. We don't have to step on the gas. But we think there's a big opportunity here. So just to be clear, and I'm not trying to defend my position, but I, I'm reflecting on what you said, Dylan. It's, it's interesting. That, but you, you don't have to go, we're, we're brevity, we don't, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But I think it still could have been a little, yeah. a little bit of a, yeah. you know, a little more self-confident. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Right. yeah. yeah. So you don't, you don't want to be like, oh, we're <laughs> killing it. Because it is it's weird in a coffee situation. But yeah. I was yeah. like, oh, my God, and they're not coming out with the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the other thing that I would have on the, it, it, like, sort of in your back pocket is the, the good news about successful consumer, business, consumer product businesses like this is that there are tons of precedent transactions, mm -hmm. meaning, like, they all get bought by somebody once they get to 20 or 30 million in sales, sometimes 100, but it's usually in that range. Um, North, you know, uh, VF Corp uh, and the list of others that own all, a ton of, like, performance brands. Um, and understanding those transactions, knowing that you know the last 20 private transactions for bag companies were companies that were between 30 and 50 million in sales with 20% EBITDA margins, and they got bought for three times revenue. Like I would just know that because that, that that's what I'm going to go try to figure out anyways. And if you know that, and then you say, look, our goal is to get to 20 million in sales with 20% EBITDA margins. At that point, we'll be growing 50% a year, and we know we built a hundred million dollar value business. Boy, that like now I'm really interested. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, nice job, you guys. Yeah. Thank you very much.
Great. Awesome. What I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to list off options for you. Okay. You can pick. So, and I'm not going to give you another medical one. I, I think some of the <laughs> medical ones want, want to do it, but I think it probably makes sense for it not to be that. Do you agree? I, I'm probably less valuable on that front, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, you get to pick uh, food, CRM SaaS, uh, web marketplace, two-sided marketplace, uh, looking around, uh, let's start with those three. So food, CRM, SaaS, and web, two-sided two web marketplace. What's it, and two-sided web marketplace doing what exactly? Just so I can. What's the one, what's the. We're creating a mobile application for students that makes it possible to connect, negotiate, transact, and establish reputations on their college community. All right, so he's just did the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do, I want to hear that too, and we can even do it after. Let's do the CRM one. Okay, CRM. Yeah. I want to hear more about that. Can I ask a question? Um, after, uh, after you uh, decide to give uh, someone money, um, how much is your involvement with them? Because you have so much more experience going from really, really early stage to exiting. It's, Most people don't. It, you know, that, that depends on the investor. So I have a, my answer for me. I mean, it depends on the firm and on the individual. Um, often at a seed stage, a lot of seed stage investors are very hands off, and they have to be, right? Because they're making 30, 40, 50 investments a year of a few hundred thousand dollars. And the whole goal is to have a big portfolio and figure out which ones work and get them funded by someone like me in the A round. Um, we, on the other hand, whether it's a, C, a big seed round, which we've done, or an A round, are super hands-on. Part of that's my own bias, like I just like early stage stuff. Um, and it's also the place where I think an investor can often be the most helpful in helping, helping form the team, um, helping find initial customers, helping strategize sort of those important early steps along the way. So, uh, you know, I only make one or two investments a year. Um, hopefully in my, you know, portfolio, what, you know, every couple of years, hopefully something has an exit of some type. And so I have seven boards right now. I've had as many as 10. Um, I would probably never go higher than that. Uh, and it's pretty time intensive. Hey, how are you? Jake. Jake. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, so I'm an undergrad here at Brown currently. Um, give you a little background about how the team formed. So my co-founder and I were doing an internship in Sydney, Australia last summer. And it was at a consultancy, digital growth consultancy. And we that, um, when we would get our clients to grow, they would have a tough time managing all the conversations with their customers that came with that growth. Um, so we started thinking of solutions that would help them um, at first we said, well, why don't we just bring all these conversations into one place where they can manage and, and talk to them. So that was a good idea, but that's not enough. That's not enough to differentiate us. So we started thinking about the text um, analytics and machine learning aspect and what can we automate that's not being automated in the CRM space. Um, so we took this idea to our boss. Uh, he liked it. and quit the next week and sold the consultancy and we've been working on it. He did. Years. Yeah. <laughs> He's about 35. He sold off the consultancy and we've, us three have been building this ever since. Um, since then we've gotten four technical people on board, two of which are machine learning master's students. Um, and so the core um, feature of the product or benefits is we analyze all the text that's coming into uh, a company, whether it's Facebook, email, um, any social media chat box on website. We analyze that text, uh, determine its priority based on what's in the message, how, how urgent does it sound, um, does this customer have a history with the company. Mm -hmm. um, along with that, we, we go into the database and based on the text, is this similar to other conversations that have happened in the past? Your database. Uh, the, the company's database. Of, but of other social interactions that you've been tracking over time? Yes. Um, and if it is, we automatically display it right next to where they're communicating with the customer with the ability to copy and paste it over mm -hmm. um, and, and tailor that. Um, as well as we display the, the history of the customer in general and who they've interacted with at the company. So the user is like a customer service agent of some type? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the progress we've made so far is uh, we've gone through several accelerators. Um, we uh, just relaunched a beta, a private beta, 
and we have three companies, three larger enterprises with letter of intents, and we have 15 um, smaller beta users as well. And how big are the large enterprise deals that you guys are thinking about um, doing? They're doing like over millions of dollars of sales per year, and we're mostly focused on e-commerce and retailers online because that's the simplest um, form of customer service. Th these are prospective customers or actual customers? Like, how big are the deals that you're trying to do? Oh, the deals we're, we're aiming for a minimum of 1000 a month for the larger enterprises, and then a growth package for, you know, a boutique e-commerce store would be 50 to to $100 a month. Got it. And, and how is this different than Sprinkler or there's a whole bunch of mm -hmm. social listening and C yeah. CSR-oriented tools that sound the same? Yep. Um, so the, the actionable stuff is different than the existing solutions. So either the solutions have data analytics or they have um, easy workflows, but they don't really combine the two and suggest um, better ways to interact with your customers. Mm -hmm. And um, because the CRM space is so crowded at the moment, and this is more of an evolutionary product rather than revolutionary, um, we're looking at ways of strategically um, finding distribution partners of already existing CRMs and having our core technology as add-ons. Like whom? Uh, like a Zendesk or a Salesforce. Yep, got it, got it. Cool, yeah. job. Um, so, uh, so a bunch of thoughts. I would say, you know, y your your opening pitch was really good. Um, like I was intrigued when you said your boss quit his job a week later and sold his firm. Um, where you then lost me was why. Mm -hmm. Because the way you described what you do sounds a lot like what the existing tools in the market do. Um, it wasn't obvious to me why you're different and better. Mm -hmm. If you had said, if you had elaborated on the fact that this thing we prototype for our clients at the firm um, was like so revolutionary for them that my boss said, let's like just sell the agency and start a company doing this. And, and or we've talked to 10 retailers and brands and they've looked at every player in the market and the thing they still struggle with is combining the analysis of the interactions with the actions that the customer service rep's supposed to do and we put them both in one place. And that's really hard to do because blank. Mm -hmm. um, it needs something like that. Because the, the, the worry in, for me, and I think for a lot of investors in this world of marketing tech stuff, if you've seen the LumaScape for marketing tech, do you know what that is? There's a, you can look it up. Look up Luma, L-U-M-A, um, which is a bank, an investment bank that does sort of an analysis of all the venture investments in different categories, and marketing tech is one of them. And they're like a gazillion companies. And I mean, it's just an incredibly overfunded arena. And which doesn't mean you can't build a great business, but it does mean the bar you have to hurdle with investors on why you're unique and different is very high. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's really important that you kind of figure out what that unique differentiation is for this relative to the competitive landscape and that you are like pretty facile with what it is the other players in the market do and why what you do can be so much better and different. Last but not least, a um, thousand bucks a month or fifty bucks a month is like brain surgery. Brain surgery. No, brain surgery. Where do you go? Brain surgery. Um, it's there's a whole go-to-market challenge around selling stuff that's that cheap. Um, that is really really hard to crack, and most people don't. Um, one of, the, one of the most interesting SMB-focused businesses I've seen that we just backed, actually, really was a freemium model. And they built a massive following with a free product. And then with additional paid features, have upsold like 20% of the base. And that's the only way I've seen it work. Companies that go to market with 50 or $100 price, you know, $50 to $1,000 price points, it's just impossible to pay for sales and marketing on those kind of prices. And churn tends, in part because churn tends to be so high with SMBs. And so I would think seriously about whether you can build more of a free solution and get more viral adoption in the market uh, and then have interesting additional features to add on. That I don't think is being done in this market today. 
and that might be a unique way to differentiate also. Awesome. Good job. Thank you. So don't go, if I may, yeah. just a couple of quick things. Uh, we, there, there are a, a couple of ventures here in B-Lab where, as you, as you point out, there are gazillions of options. And it's hard to figure out how much effort they should put in, even in an initial conversation like this, to what I call get out ahead of the problem. And it's, it sounds like you're recommending get out ahead of it. Own, own the com competitive landscape. Own that you have this problem. Don't try to pull the wool over the eye of the listener, especially since we know Scott is an expert in this sort of you know, B2B market kinds of stuff. So it's like, tick them off. Like, we got this, 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 this. And here's the thing. It's kind of what's got. This is the thing that's missing. Uh, so 100%. Get out ahead of it. Yeah, the, 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 I, too much naivete, despite the fact that I think that's helpful for entrepreneurs to some extent, is not great. And like in these competitive markets, it's super important. Like lo loving your idea and being somewhat ignorant, I'm not suggesting this is you, but being sort of ignorant of the landscape right. is not helpful. That's not compelling. Um, I, so I 100% agree with your point. Yeah, so uh, our, our food venture, they're working on a very healthy snack, and my, my uh, advice to them is look at the snack aisle, look 100%. at the, you know, and get out ahead of it. <laughs> Some, I don't know exactly how to do it, but you've got to do it because there's just huge initial skepticism yeah. on the part of the listener. And there are, and that food's a whole different ball game um, in this kind of arena. There are reasons why the existing big enterprise players are unlikely to go way down market. And there may be a dearth of tools at the kind of SMB level um, where there's a void that you can fill. And it may be that a freemium model is the way to get there. Maybe this low price point model you've got is a way to get there. Like that's TBD and you guys can test your way into that. But you need to explain to me where that void exists and why. If you said to me, look, Sprinkler's great and it does everything we do, but there's no way they're going to go tackle the 100,000 SMB marketers of the world that also need this capability, I believe that. Okay. And the last thing I'll ask is, is um, we, as a communication style, even in this kind of thing, uh, we've, we, you know, we've talked to, I've talked to Jake and others have mentioned about the passion thing and the sort of modulation. I wasn't feeling it still today. I, I agree. So, I agree, so, and it's and I and like being chill is fine, but I, I do agree with that a little bit. Okay. Like like, you know, the, yes, you, you gotta like, you, you, your your belief needs to come through. Your enthusiasm for it needs to come through for sure. And so we we've, we've had Barbara Tannenbaum uh, come. I don't know if you know who that is. Did you take her class when you were here, or was I, that before? Was, was that, that the new? Wait, what was her class? Her, Persuasive communication. No, I did not, unfortunately. Yeah. So I, I wonder, even body language, uh, Jake, if, if moving forward in the chair, sitting, you know, you know, and, and sort of projecting like this is like you're almost a racehorse trying to get out of the gate kind of thing, without being ridiculous about it. But the total chill thing, I'm not sure. I'm back, back to you guys. <coughs> I, 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 want to I want to invite you. This is the kind of honesty we're trying to yeah. do at B Lab. So I invite you. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a real thing. Um, I I think that here's the spectrum. The more something uh, hinges on underlying IP that you are an expert in, the less I think charisma matters, and the more technical cred matters. Um, and so, and, and, and I don't think as investors, we have an expectation that everyone is the all singing, all dancing, everything. And so if you're the sort of brains of the operation with this insight and it's really technical and that's sort of why you believe, I don't know that you have to like kind of get me so excited on the charisma front. But when it's B2B software, like the reality is there's very little IP in these things. Um, and what I, what I need to believe is that through sheer force of will, you and team are gonna find a way. And some of that comes through in personality. And sometimes, look, sometimes like investors over index on their reaction to charisma and make mistakes because people are super compelling even though the idea is not that good. Um, but that's our issue, not yours. Your issue should be be compelling. 
Um, and that has to do with why this can be a great business, why you're so excited about it. And look, as, as I talked about earlier, enthusiasm is contagious. And so you got you to gotta communicate that. And I, we, we've discovered we had someone, uh, Maura Ahrens Neely, who was uh, an expert on introverted entrepreneurs, hmm. has written a book about Interesting. it. Uh, and, and it's, uh, you know, we, we've had conver honest conversations among the B-Lab group about how do you, how do you reach down deep and, and uh, communicate the passion that's there and surmount perhaps a reluctance to be a chauffeur, a showman. Or and just on that front, you know, I, ta I talked earlier about um, Jen Hyman at Rent the Runway and Mark Laurie at, at Jet, and Jen's a show person. I mean, she's like, like just unbelievably charismatic. And that's one end of the spectrum. That's not required. It's nice to have, but it's certainly not required. Mark is not. Mark's actually kind of an introvert. The reason in this kind of dialogue, which is how I first met Mark, actually, and decided to invest in Jet, I was so compelled, is that every question I asked, his, he communicated an understanding of the issues and had an answer for me that both kind of satisfied my concern and taught me a few things I never would have thought of. So like when I asked about Sprinkler, you don't have to jump up and down and tell me how bad Sprinkler is and why your thing's better, but if you had some under, sort of nuanced understanding of why the legacy tools like Sprinkler are unlikely to tap this market, either because of their economic model or their product efficiencies, like I think passion and, and uh, enthusiasm and belief can come through in sort of your depth of understanding. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So maybe compensate for the showmanship 100%. With, with depth of understanding and, uh, and the ability to communicate that effectively. 100%. Wow. Okay. Great. Thanks, everybody. Stop.